Tenakoto Tenatato Katoa. Now my Haere Mai. Greetings and welcome to Auckland Conversations. It's great to see such a fantastic crowd. We have a very special Auckland Conversation today. We're excited to have you with us, whether you're joining in this room of probably about 400 people or where you're live or you're at home actually live streaming anywhere, anywhere in the world. My name is John Morrow and I'm Auckland Council's Chief Sustainability Officer. And our team's mission is to mainstream sustainability both here in Auckland and perhaps beyond. We like to get ambitious. Simply put, it's to make Auckland better for all forever. I'll say a bit more about this in a minute, but for now, some housekeeping. Um, restrooms are at the back, uh, near the displays. Uh, in the unlikely event of an emergency, an alarm will sound, and we will be directed out of the building by our very kind ushers. Fantastic. Use common sense, that great mix between tact and uh, courtesy. Um, and of course, I, I feel the Twitter sphere rumbling and trending, and uh, uh, we've got a great community online as well. So join us there with your insights and your thoughts. Um, you could find me at Sustainable AKL, and you can use the hand, or I'm sorry, not the handle, the hashtag AKL Conversations for this event. I'm going to take a photo of you all and get it started. You don't see this too often, right? That's a beautiful crowd. Boom. Okay, done. So let's get this event to trend in Auckland. And also remember, also remember to live in the moment. Um, take your face away from your phone once in a while and enjoy the now. Um, we don't want our special guests to actually uh, think we're bored and following something that Trump did in the States, because that would be really depressing. So Auckland Conversations would not be possible without the ongoing backing of our wonderful supporters. Uh, we'd like to thank our partner sponsors, Racine, Seen. There we go. And Jib. And we'd like to thank our program supporters, Brookfield's Lawyers, Boffa Miskel, Architectural Designers New Zealand, MR Cagney, New Zealand Institute of Architects, New Zealand Planning Institute, and the New Zealand Green Building Council, all of which you can read right in front of you. Let's give all my, them all a hand for making this night possible. We're also quite lucky to have a number of not-for-profit organizations uh, displaying in the back. Um, they, uh, if you haven't done so already, go back there and look at their stuff. Some of it's fantastic. Um, and if you, yeah, if they'll be around after the, after the show as well. Um, you can also find copies of our recent Auckland Sustainability Quarterly that my office puts out on the back right. I think it's where the food was, which is really strategic. So you might have seen it on your way by the food. Um, we have with us tonight, just to give, give them an intro, we have Eco Matters Trust in the back. We had uh, a really great visit there with the C40 folk um, earlier this week, yesterday. We have the Waitamata Low Carbon Network. We have the Sustainable Business Network. Uh, we have Generation Zero. And we also have, I know lurking somewhere, the Sustainable Business Council, and probably other folks as well in the audience. So let's give them a hand for their fantastic work. <laughs> so I'd like to take us back to my earlier mention of mainstreaming sustainability. I'm just going to set it up for, uh, for the mayor and Mark Watts as we uh, start our conversation here. Um, sustainability and climate change are synonymous these days um, in fighting climate change. And nothing could be more important than where that actually plays out. Um, cities are both on the front lines of climate impacts, and they're also the vanguards of climate solutions. And that's really what tonight is all about. It's a celebration of cities and a celebration of our role turning around one of the most difficult challenges we've had ever in the history of the world. So in Auckland, our blueprint is Low Carbon Auckland Action Plan and the five transformations and a regional goal of a 40% reduction by 2040. Now, it may be a council document, uh, but it was given life by over 150 organizations and businesses. And those folks who worked with us on it, um, we rely on you all to help us make it happen. And of course, seeing what's happening both within and outside council, we're going to do exactly that. We're, on, we're, gonna, we're gonna make some change happen. Um, in our own business, council and the CCOs are agreeing our fleets and our buildings, reducing our energy use. We're procuring more sustainably. We're influencing the wider supply chain with our spend. Um, throughout Auckland, we're also providing transport choice, activating places for people, and using the circular, circular economy to close the loop on waste. Other businesses are helping to lead the way, installing solar PV systems, jockeying for greenest building in Auckland or New Zealand, uh, greening their fleets, reducing their climate risks, and then passing some of those benefits on to their employees and the consumers. You can see great examples of SBN's work, for instance, in the business community on the display in the back lobby. Or you might want to turn to the stranger next to you and ask them what they've been up to. 
I'd also like to shout out to those community groups and local boards because they're creating that local groundswell. Uh, we had, like I said, a fantastic tour of Eco Matters Trust and got really to dig into the compost collective, get our hands dirty. Um, the Wetamata local board has also up, um, been up to their own local carbon, uh, low carbon action plan. Um, they invite you to be part of a new knowledge network, workshops and events, um, and they're kicking off a meeting, I think, later this autumn, so join them. But is all of this enough? I suppose we wouldn't be here if it were. So to get the change we need and to become the city that we aspire to be, we need to step it up, and we must step it up. We've got a bold and ambitious target. It's going to require a lot of effort from all of us to get there. But I challenge us to raise that bar. Uh, other cities like Auckland have gone a bit further than we have. Um, they've become climate resilient or are becoming climate resilient, and they're actually setting their sights on carbon neutrality. What these other cities recognize is that tackling climate change delivers a suite of irresistible co-benefits, making our lives better and protecting the things that we really care about. Action on climate change delivers better air quality, better water quality, uh, better human health. Action on climate change can bring us better transport and housing choice. Action on climate change can make us fairer and more equitable as a society. And action on climate change delivers significant financial savings and can bring us a green jobs, higher wage, economic revolution. So cities are where the action is, acting because it's in our direct self-interest in the short and long term, and also because it's in the direct uh, interest of our residents. We're really thrilled and honored um, to be part of uh, C40 as its newest, newest member, and some other folks are gonna speak to that in just a moment. Um, we're doing cities like Melbourne, Vancouver, Seattle, Copenhagen, Sydney, London, Rio, these are, these are cities recognized around their world for their efforts uh, on climate protection. Um, and we're also really thrilled and honored to have C40's executive director with us and regional director Milag and Mark. Um, it's a really special evening. So you'll learn tonight that cities that don't move on climate protection will simply be left behind. And those that do act, um, instead of waiting for permission, but they're committed to lead boldly, to push the boundaries, and to reinvent themselves into better places for all people, they're gonna change the world. So, we've got a really great lineup for you tonight, and it's gonna be a fun evening of conversation. I'll be back to MC um, after our, uh, with an exciting panel who's gonna join us. But first, to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Mayor Len Brown. I think you might know Mayor Len Brown. He's the first mayor of the Super City. Um, he hails from Tamarnui, but he's really an Otara boy uh, since, I think, about seven, yeah? Um, mayor Brown has really led us into a new age, um, and a lot of that is around the work on climate. He should really be congratulated for his vision for the world's most livable city as our vision as a city, and for really doing the hard yards to get us there. Most recently, I think, to mention the persistence in diplomacy uh, bringing the CRL to Auckland like soon. Mayor Brown was in Paris with the official delegation, spoke at the Global Lead Cities Network on Sustainable Procurement, spent a lot of time with fellow mayors and C40. I won't steal his intro, but suffice to say, while sharing crepes and coffee and train rides in Paris, I got to see firsthand the passion that Mayor Brown has for our city. And you might imagine that others saw that passion as well. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Len Brown. Kia ora katoa, mihi mai, mihi mai, mihi mai, e kui mai, koroma, e te iwi a Tamaki Makaurau e te whānau, o Tamaki Makaurau, nō reira tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, and good evening, first of all I want to acknowledge John, our sustainability officer. Uh, it's a challenging job, John, and you're doing outstandingly in it. So everyone, can you put your hands together for that young man there? He's doing a great job. I want to acknowledge our Deputy Mayor, Penny, and councillors and local board chairs and members who are here. Thank you for coming along here tonight and sharing in this very important message uh, delivered to us from C40. And in their presence, I want to acknowledge the two representatives here, Mark Watts, who's going to speak to us tonight, uh, and Milag San Jose Ballesteros. Uh, can you please both stand so that we can acknowledge uh, our two honoured guests here tonight, Mark and Milag. Uh, Mark, uh, you're going to speak to us tonight about C40, but in particular the challenges for cities in action and specifically around sustainability. And 
Um, what I'd like to do uh, for a start for five minutes or so is just sort of give you the context of the city, some of the challenges that we've faced, past, present and future, and where I think we stand, and this should give you a good framework uh, upon which to uh, reflect to us for three quarters of an hour and then involve yourself in the debate. Uh, so um, I became the mayor in 2010, Mark, and we created a plan, the Auckland Plan, and John has reflected on uh, the vision upon which that is based. And you would have heard this in a number of cities around the world, looking to create the world's uh, most livable city. And we've done reasonably well in that space. You will all be aware that in the global indices, we're in most of the top tens. Um, but right at the heart of that, of the sense of livability in any city, is a real commitment to the issue of combating climate change, embracing the challenges of adaptation and the opportunities of mitigation is a big part of us becoming the world's most livable city. And so the Auckland plan, the spatial plan that we were instructed to prepare uh, under the amalgamation guidelines set by the government, sets a target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40% below 1990 levels by the year 2040. And we're also getting ready to adapt to the inevitable climate impacts that are coming our way and we see them. For Auckland that means changes to temperature and rainfall patterns, more frequent and intense weather events and accelerated sea level rises. We're all too aware of the challenges we face shoring up infrastructure and managing insurance costs as well as the impacts on biodiversity, productivity and on our communities in general. So getting to 2040, we're working towards a livable, prosperous and low carbon future. We don't expect it to be plain sailing. That's why we've appointed a sustainability officer, especially as our growth continues to soar. Uh, Mark and Milag, we are the fastest growing city in the Southern Hemisphere. Another 700,000 people will be here in the next 30 years, both from internal growth and migration. Currently, we're growing by 819 new residents and 344 new homes every week. Uh, there's new streets created every two days, 670 cars are coming into our port every day. Eight new classrooms and teachers every week and 405 new jobs across Auckland. That's some idea of the challenge that we face every week. Which brings me back to the point that has been recognised around the world. If we're going to have a real shot at addressing climate change, and that's why it was just brilliant to be with 635 other mayors and regional leaders in Paris. Cities is where it's at. Last year, the Global Commission on Economy and Climate released their findings that putting the effort into cities, better public transport, green buildings, better waste management, could save 22 trillion US dollars by 2050 and it would avoid the equivalent greenhouse gas emissions of India every year. Better public transport, green buildings, more effective waste, Auckland is working in all of these spaces. Why? Because it's good for our climate, it's good for our communities, and it's also good for business. So, just one or two recent highlights. Uh, we've seen public transport patronage rocket to 80 million trips per year now with someone coming out of London. Of course, this doesn't look that huge. Uh, but we are growing public transport patronage uh, at 20,000 extra trips every day, per day, on public transport. Now, that's not bad. Uh, we're adding 53 kilometres of cycleways by 2018. I think that's light, and I think you'll see there'll be additions over and above that. Uh, as our cycling patronage lifts, and we're increasing cycling patronage by about 7% per year at the moment, which I'd like to see about 20%, and I expect that we will see that over the next year or two. On top of that, electrification of our trains. Yes, we just electrified our trains. Uh, again, uh, this was done about a thousand years ago in London, but never mind. Um, these have uh, removed about 1% of, uh, of our greenhouse gas emissions. Not huge, but steps in the right direction. Down the road from here, you'll see roadworks that mark the start of the preparation of the building of our city rail link. Now, we like having long discussions here, Mark. This took 100 years of a discussion. Uh, but uh, at last, it's starting to happen, and we'll get the jackhammers out and commence next month, or May, rather. That will lead to Auckland becoming a much, much better place to live. 
The government has come on board by agreeing to help fund it, and we are working closely with the government on agreement on how the transport system needs for Auckland are developed. So in beside that type of thing, we're doing what's called a transport alignment program. Now this is a program to align transport funding delivery over 30 years between the government and our council. It could be the most significant thing that we do in many years and beside our Auckland Unitary Plan. Our own uh, headquarters building is now 40% more energy efficient and we've cut our power bill by more than half a million dollars a year. We're getting ready to roll out wa uh, food waste collection across urban areas, diverting 40 percent of the average wheelie bin out of the waste stream and capturing it for good uses. But there's been challenges. I know that in this audience we are well aware of the, some of the recent debates we've had about a unitary plan, all the rules as to how we will build the city. You would have heard that quite a bit already so far, Mark. Uh, the unitary plan puts intensification at the top of our solution list and signals a commitment to manage growth sustainability while ensuring housing developers adhere to strong quality requirements. Intensification means Auckland can be a compact city, a city going up as well as out. We absolutely must have a range of housing options, housing that offers people choices in different topographies. Mixed developments that meet a range of needs, affordable housing also. Despite recent reports, our plan is not something for people to fear. It's not a document that will see high rises appearing all around Auckland overnight. On the contrary, it will see careful quality planning that provides for a range of housing options that Aucklanders are looking forward to and are dead wanting. And secondly, it will match our transport plans. Our low carbon uh, Auckland Action Plan, the plan that got, that uh, rather gets us to the 2040 target was released in 2014. It was a result of the dedicated efforts of more than 150 organisations and businesses. While guided by the Auckland Council, it is a collaborative plan for all of us Aucklanders. And now we're becoming a C40 city. Yeah. Why don't we give us another round of applause? Thank God for being a C40 city. <laughs> this is taking us onto the global stage where the debates are had and putting Auckland front and centre. It's another opportunity to work with the best and brightest around the world to get Auckland moving faster towards its carbon targets. I was fortunate to travel to Paris for the climate negotiations in December. As well as the UN meeting, Paris was the site of the largest ever gathering of mayors working on combating climate change. It reinforced for me the message that I started with tonight. When it comes to climate change, cities are right at the heart of that change. I don't need to tell you what you already know. The sooner we act, the better. Creating new opportunities right now and huge cost savings in the long run. Here in Auckland, I believe we've made a reasonably good start. The massive investment in infrastructure that is now coming into play is going to enable a lot more positive beneficial change. We're heading for low carbon lifestyles. And let's just remind us, New Zealand and the world signed up to reducing and in fact finalising our dependence on fossil fuels within 70 years. So to get to the main business of the night, it's a real pleasure to have Mark and Milag here, but for Mark to speak to us as the Executive Director of C40. I met him in Paris and have had the opportunity to spend a bit of time with him in here in Auckland over the last few days. He's a fantastic champion for climate change and for us cities. Mark used to work for the Mayor of London, Red Ken Livingston, uh, as his climate change, I've told him the joke about the fact that half Auckland has called me Red Lem when they're really annoyed with me, um, as his climate change and sustainability transport advisor. He was instrumental in the transformation of the city. Congestion charging and cycling infrastructure to name just two of the major projects uh, that he helped make happen. Now, as the executive, direct, executive Director of C40, Mark has an even bigger challenge on his hands, catalyzing the low-carbon transformation of 83 cities around the world. These cities represent 25% of the world's GDP and are home to one in 12 of the globe's people. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
Let's put our hands together for Mark. It's a real pleasure to have him here. Go. Thanks very much. Luck, yes, thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor Brown, and uh, thank you to John. And indeed, uh, thank you very much for the, the warm welcome, uh, not just tonight, uh, but over the last, is it almost 48 hours uh, that Milag and myself have, have been here. Uh, we really have been made to feel very welcome. And we're, we're really delighted uh, that Auckland is the newest member of C40. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time tonight uh, explaining what C40 is and what we do as well as taking some of the examples of leading action across the C40 member cities to hopefully try and build up a picture of what the really successful low-carbon cities of the future will look like. But perhaps it's worth just saying at the start that C40 is quite deliberately a fairly exclusive club. It aims to be the representative of the really the greatest cities in the world and the mayors that are showing the most leadership on climate change uh, and are really focused on taking that leadership to change the whole of the world, not just their own cities. And membership of C40 is by invitation only. It's at the behest of the rest of the existing members uh, of the club. And I've, I've seen in the last 48 hours here just why so many of the C40 members wanted Auckland to join C40, because you really have got some vision going on here and some really brave leadership to try and change this city for the better, but in a way I think that can be a real example for other cities across the world. So just to uh, give you a bit of background, uh, this is the little, the little red dots really are quite small here, aren't they? But there are 83 red dots on that map, uh, which are spread across the world, so this is uh, an organisation, despite its name, has over 80 uh, members. Uh, it started 10 years ago, in fact was created, it was originally the C20, it was uh, when the G20 nations were meeting in Britain, and my former boss, Ken Livingston, the then Mayor of London, wanted to bring together the leaders of the capital cities of those nations to put pressure on the governments to take climate change seriously. It quickly, through a partnership with Bill Clinton and his foundation, became uh, a club of 40 cities, and now we're growing, we'll probably plateau uh, at about 100, and representing most of the big, really big cities in the world, so those with a population uh, of over 3 million, which is the criteria to join, and then a handful of so-called innovator cities, ones with a smaller population, but which are recognised uh, as showing real leadership on climate change. Uh, so it's uh, a leadership club. It's uh, created by mayors, led by mayors, uh, and is very much a kind of data-driven organisation uh, with tough participation standards. So there are no fees uh, to join C40. Uh, we're entirely funded by philanthropy, uh, including Mike Bloomberg, uh, formerly the mayor of New York, one of the richest uh, people in, in the world, but some other uh, philanthropic organisations in Europe also. Um, but we do ask quite a lot of our members to be part of the club in participation standards. So to be able to demonstrate that they really are taking action on climate change, that it's accelerating and it's moving towards the targets that the world needs to hit in order to avoid catastrophic climate change. Uh, and that's codified in something now called the, the Compact of Mayors, which is sort of the equivalent to the, the Paris Agreement that was signed by the nation states of the world uh, back in December. So this is uh, something that Auckland has committed to, that every city has uh, an emissions inventory based on a global standard that we help to create, robust targets for reducing emissions and improving resilience, and a plan for how that will be achieved that can be publicly uh, measured. And our philosophy, uh, our kind of theory of change, is, is essentially that the best inspiration for one city leader is another mayor who's already solved the problem. So we are all about sharing best practice, working collaboratively between the different cities so that every city on each individual issue can move at the pace of the fastest. Every city in C40 is a world leader in something, often e even if they don't know it, but no city uh, has got the capacity to be the world leader in everything. So we're just trying to bring that knowledge together uh, so that everyone can move more quickly. And you can see in the, the, the columns along the bottom, we organise across 
the areas where mayors typically uh, have powers. And every city is unique, but there are, uh, if you like your philosophy, uh, the Hegelian concept of a unique combination of universal elements. And what we're trying to look for is the universal, the things where 10 or 20 cities have similar powers, similar problems, and if we put them together, they can solve them much more quickly. So in the, in the perfect case, this is a real example, uh, but it, we, we wish all of the things in C40 worked like this. The way that those solutions would be spread would be something like this. Uh, the mayor of Rio, who is now uh, my boss, he's the chair of the C40, Eduardo Pires. He turned up at a C40 event five or six years ago, armed with a speech that his staff had diligently written for him, uh, setting out how Rio was a world leader in waste management. And as he sat waiting to speak, hearing the mayors of San Francisco and one or two other cities outlining their waste management programs, he slowly crumpled up his speech, <laughs> realizing that he was nothing like uh, a leader in what he was doing. Went back to Rio uh, in a rage, and he, uh, he's a man whose rages you do not want to be uh, in front of. G called his waste director into the room and said, next time I'll get on a platform, I want to be better than these other cities. How are we going to get there? They called up C40, and we started to put them together with some of those cities uh, that they had been listening to. In this case, uh, to begin with, it was New York and Stockholm, who sent over a team to Rio, helped the waste team there put together uh, a plan. Later on, some other cities, San Francisco, Bogota, also got involved. I'll cut to the, to the end of the story. The net, when the mayor was able to stand up a couple of years later, they managed to increase their recycling rate from just over 1% to 15%. And he was, he was able to be proud of, of what, they, what they had achieved. And that knowledge is now shared throughout the C40 network. It's not always that simple. But in a perfect world, that's the way uh, that our organization works. So most of the, the activity of C40 happens uh, with mayors talking to mayors, with senior city leaders talking to each other in networks on things like bus rapid transit or maybe the economists of the city getting together on green growth or indeed on waste management. But we also do provide on a competitive basis direct uh, advisors into cities. Uh, you can see the ones that we're currently uh, have in operation at the moment. Uh, and here, C40 is paying the salary of uh, a, an expert who can go and be part of a mayoral team and help shift the thinking or help shift the delivery on a particular subject. I won't go through all of these because there's far too many, but to give you one, I think, really interesting example, in Addis Ababa uh, in Ethiopia, we have an, an advisor who is helping the mayor get a shift to a, a really uh, extensive public transport system based on bus rapid transit, but where there's been huge opposition to that program from the taxi drivers in the city who see their livelihoods threatened. And she is helping uh, persuade, uh, explain to the taxi drivers how they can benefit from this change, and indeed many of them are now becoming bus drivers uh, in the city. Uh, one of the things we, we in, in C40 that we, we definitely like to focus on is success rather than failure. So whilst in private we provide reports to every mayor that shows how their city is performing compared to all the other cities in their region and indeed across the world, in public we're not about shaming, we want to be naming success. So we do a lot of celebration, uh, we have a big awards ceremony each year that recognises global leadership uh, and indeed partnered with Sustainia 100 uh, that shows the 100 best city solutions uh, each year. So moving on um, to where the mayor left off and, uh, and Paris, I think we are in a very different situation since the COP uh, in, in December. And it's easy to be cynical about, about these things, um, but actually Paris really was a breakthrough. The, the agreement that was reached there at COP21 is a game changer, and at least the momentum that it's created gives us a chance of delivering what we need to do on, on climate change to avoid a really catastrophic situation. Uh, an environmental commentator in, in the UK, I think, got it almost right, although he's a bit on the, the kind of doom side, when he said that Paris, compared to what it could have been, the Paris Agreement was a miracle. So actually, all of the nations of the world coming together and agreeing something on climate change, which has been such a difficult issue for the last 20 years, really was a miracle. On the other hand, he said, compared to what it should have been, it's a disaster. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a disaster, but there is a, there is a flaw in, in what was agreed in Paris in that it's a very aspirational target, and much better than most of us thought, that we should stabilise 
uh, global warming at 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial average. And prior to Paris, most of the focus had been on a higher target of 2 degrees. But at least half of the world's nations have pointed out that they just can't survive with a 2 degree uh, average temperature rise. But what the agreement lacks is a real mechanism for how that target is going to be delivered. And indeed, the treaty itself doesn't come into being until 2020. And that's really where I want to focus for the rest of my time, which is the role that cities can play. Because I think it's really the case that just as mayors and regional leaders and business leaders really provided, along with many, many community organizations, provided the, the, the bottom-up force that got the, those national leaders finally to agree to something in Paris, so now the nation states are looking to city leaders to deliver in a way that makes, makes it possible for that Paris agreement to really be delivered. And three reasons on, on the screen here why that's the case. The first is that whilst nation states have now got to work out how to make the collaboration that they've agreed to really work, the mayors of the world have been collaborating for a very long time. Uh, and in C40 alone, since the failed talks in Copenhagen in 2009, over 10,000 individual climate actions have been measured within the C40 network. Over 30 of our cities, so over a third of the membership, have already peaked their emissions. Global emissions need to peak in 2020, so they're way, they're way ahead of schedule. Secondly, that when we look at the potential for what could be delivered, and here just focusing on the C40 cities, about twice as much as has already been, been delivered uh, has the potential to be delivered in the next decade. So in numbers, uh, about 27,000 more uh, climate actions that we think can be delivered. And just focusing on a small proportion of those, those that would have the biggest impact and where the powers are most clearly available already to the mayors to deliver, 2,300 priority actions could save 450 megatons of carbon between now uh, and 2020. But the final one on the screen is probably the, the biggest one, and one of the things that captured attention in Paris. When you, when you map forward uh, and look at the decisions that are going to be made across the board, a third of the remaining uh, safe carbon budget, and safe in, in inverted commas, the total amount of carbon that scientists have estimated we can safely risk putting into the atmosphere before uh, making runaway climate change inevitable, a third of that budget will be consumed by decisions made by mayors in the next four or five years if they make bad decisions. So there's a huge emphasis on getting things right. The mayors that are in power right now making the right decisions in the next four or five years. And the biggest portion of those decisions will be made by the mayors in the C40. The other thing that I think in the, the analysis that's come out of Paris, when you look at this new target, this 1.5 degree stabilization target, it turns out there's very little evidence base for how it can be achieved. Actually, there's only one really serious uh, peer-reviewed scientific paper on it. But what comes out very strongly from that is it's very, very much a focus on urban solutions. So the previous targets had sort of maxed out the supply side solutions, the, the shift to renewable energy. What a 1.5 degree target means is we've really got to constrain demand for fossil fuel energy over the next few years. And when you look at where demand currently is for energy, it's mostly 70, 80% of it is in urban areas. And so in the next five, 10 years, there's got to be real shifts in building energy use in particular, transport energy use, and both of those are, are systematically affected by the choices that we make around land use planning, the spatial development of the city, something that I know is a big issue here in Auckland. So very much the levers that need to be pulled to put us on a course to deliver the Paris Agreement are in the hands of cities and, and, and mayors. And we know what we're, we're aiming for in the long term, John referred to, to this, the sort of car the carbon neutral city target. What that means at a more individual level is that we have to get the average carbon emissions per person down to about two tons per person. Actually, I think that's a rather conservative estimate. It's going to be more like about 1.5 tons uh, per person. There aren't any cities in C40 uh, that are, would consider themselves to be fully developed that are at that level. There are some, some of our African cities that are way below. Addis Ababa is barely 0.1 tons per person. But when you look on the top of the screen here, the real leaders in the world and in C40 are the Scandinavian cities, hovering around the two, two and a half tons 
uh, per person. But most of the rest of the world, these are averages across the cities. The US, 16.5 tons. Australia, the same. China, 7.2. That's about the level uh, of Auckland from the figures that I've seen. The, UA, the uh, European Union, a little under. So we're looking at reductions of 70-80% or more uh, over the next few decades in order to get down to those kinds of um, totals. The good news, I think, is that we broadly know what it will take to create low-carbon, healthy, prosperous, I'd just say simply successful cities in the future. Because there won't be any successful cities that aren't low-carbon. Let's be very clear about that. This is now, this is, the race to be low-carbon is the race to be successful, prosperous, livable cities also. The, the two things are completely joined. And whilst in C40 we're not in any way prescriptive about what our mayors should be doing, it's very interesting when you get any room of the big city mayors together, and Lem was very much part of this in Paris, all the mayors are talking about the same thing. They're talking about moving away from sprawling car-based cities to compact, dense, livable cities. High degrees of mobility, highly connected cities, but where the mobility is based on mass transit, on public transport, and increasingly cycling uh, and walking. And finally, cities that are really coordinated, both in the sense of very data-driven, so very efficient in the way that they design the new infrastructure for the city, and working uh, as a system, the departments of the city join together, the government working with business and with the community. But also, I think, critically, although I would say this, of course, the most successful mayors, the most successful cities in the next few years will be the ones that are able to look out the most, that don't just focus inwards, but see and are willing to learn and steal and copy from the best ideas all around the world. So just to go through uh, those three headings. First of all, thinking about the concept of, of compact cities. And I think, very simply here, sprawl is the enemy and density is the friend. You just have to look at the numbers. So the New Climate Economy Commission, which has done really outstanding work on showing the path towards a low-carbon vision of the future, they estimate that 60% of growth in energy consumption through to 2030 will be the result of urban sprawl. So just by planning our cities better, we could cut the uh, business-as-usual growth in emissions by 60%. But you can see this in a, in a different indice in terms of economic performance. The, the city of Copenhagen, and I'll, I'll come to explain the image on the screen, but this is of, of Copen, Copenhagen, one of the richest, most accessible, successful, most livable cities in the world, spends only 4% of its annual GDP on transport, on maintaining the transport system and improving it. Contrast that with another C40 member, Houston, who, by the way, has got a fantastic and very radical and brave mayor, but starts with a legacy of that real sprawling North American design city. They spend 15, 1.5% of their GDP each year on maintaining that car-based sprawling uh, city. And so Co Copenhagen has this huge economic premium each year by having gone down a compact, dense planned route. And this is no accident. It's the result of really strong uh, regulation and legislation over two decades uh, and based on really rigorous enforcement of that. And the, the simple explanation of it is that in Copenhagen, you're just not allowed to build any new major development if it isn't close to a public transport uh, connection. Uh, and that's resulted in a pattern of density, which you see illustrated on the, on the screen here. The, the re oh, that, mo that definitely moved without me touching it. The, the, the red is showing the, uh, where the highest levels of density are in the city. And you can see they have a kind of five-finger uh, design that maps the five main public transport arteries into the city and then really dense uh, at the core. And I should note here, in one of the richest cities in the world, 45% of trips to work are made by bicycle. And this is in a city, it may be flat, but it's bloody cold in the winter. It snows for three months, and they still cycle to work. A different part of the world, but the same philosophy, Portland in Oregon on the west coast of the United States, has got a really interesting proposal, again around dense, compact cities, but what they call complete neighborhoods. So countering the, the, the pattern of development there has been uh, in the center of the city, it's really quite dense, and there's, there's a, they've kept, they managed to keep one of those cities that kept their old uh, trolley lines, uh, and it's allowed great public transport. But in the outer edges of the city, as they've grown very fast, similar to Auckland, from 200,000 to 600,000 people in a matter of a couple of decades, uh, there's much more sprawl. 
So what they're trying to do there is to ensure that every one of their neighbourhoods will have easy access to schools, parks and grocery stores uh, as a basic thing within walking or cycling uh, distance. And this is forcing uh, a greater density um, acro uh, across the city, which is broadly welcomed. There are also, I've noted on the, the bullets on the side here, they'd be very envious of what I've seen here uh, in, in Auckland. Uh, I saw someone describe it as a city within a forest, which I thought was, was wonderful. They're trying to get to 33% uh, of their city being covered by tree canopy. I was warned about pressing these too hard. So that's, that's two examples around the, the compact density. But there's a real a th a completely connected theme to that spatial design of being compact uh, and dense, building upwards rather than building out. And that is the ability that you gain to have a much more efficient transport system, much greater mobility, faster journey times, uh, lower emissions, uh, greater uh, reliability. Uh, and I love this quote from the, the now re-elected mayor of Bogota in uh, Colombia, Enrico Penalosa. An advanced city is not where the poor drive cars, but where the rich use the bus. Uh, and this really strikes home for, for me uh, as a Londoner. Uh, our, our infamous, I guess you could say, Prime Minister in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher, once said, if you see a man, she was very gender specific, I'm afraid, if you see a man on a bus aged over 30, you know you're looking at a failure. And this infused British transport policy thinking for two decades that everybody aspired to be in a car and only the poor should be shoved uh, on the buses. One of the greatest things uh, in what Red Ken did uh, in, in London was he, he changed the demographics of bus users by making the buses just so good that everyone wanted to use them. So you're as likely to sit next to a banker as you are to sit next to a builder or indeed a retired person or someone who's, who's unemployed. But the reason why we really have to focus on, on, on mass transit is not just uh, those questions uh, uh, of equity, but the, the, the pure statistics about the cost of a car-driven society. 3.7 million premature deaths from air pollution each year around the world, and that's probably an under underestimate. 1.25 million deaths from road collisions each year. Um, congestion in many of the C40 cities consumes four or five, or it has a cost of four or five percent of GDP. In Beijing, they estimate 15 percent of their GDP is lost through the cost um, of congestion. In the USA, the, the opportunity to move to more transit-oriented development is estimated to reduce household expenditure by 20%. So some real economic and social benefits uh, from moving towards a more public transit-oriented um, system. And some examples of that from, from across uh, the C40. One of the big success stories uh, in city networks in, in recent years has been the total uh, transformation in thinking about how you can use bus services. So rather than just being slow local services that stop all the time, that they really can be an alternative to the metro. Very much an idea that started in Latin America, in Curitiba, in Bogota. Bus rapid transit has now taken off all around the world. Indeed, the last time I looked, there were over 150 cities that had, had adopted it, and most now are in the rich West countries. Um, but it started originally in Latin America because it's much cheaper uh, to build a overground uh, bus system than it is to build a new metro, a tenth of the cost uh, on average. But if you build it to a specification that's really high standards, nice covered boarding, quality buses, not having to step up to get, to get on them, cheap fares, then the people who use it feel valued and will, will want to shift to it, will take pride in taking the bus to work rather uh, than the car. And the mayor in, in Joburg in South Africa has taken it a stage further. They call it Corridors of Freedom. Uh, and they're using their bus rapid transit to connect what are still the mostly black ghettos like Soweto, uh, where there are very few jobs, with the city centre, the legacy of apartheid, connecting where most of the population live with most, where most of the jobs, but taking the release in land value all along the route of those, those bus routes uh, so that not just the property developers gain from that, but the city council is able to gain a tax premium and build social housing uh, all along the route that helps people move out of the ghettos. Of course, if we're moving to uh, a much greater extent of public transport, particularly the bus network, 
then the fuel that's put into them becomes really uh, important. And most buses around the world still run on diesel. But there's a revolution underway, and it started uh, in China. One of the really exciting things for us in C40 is in the last 18 months or so, the Chinese government has sanctioned Chinese cities uh, to join C40 uh, en masse. Uh, and as they start to engage, it's really changing the thinking of many other cities in C40. We've had a, a low emission vehicle network uh, for almost 10 years, and the most ambitious cities have maybe had 10 electric buses on the road, 20 uh, in some cases, none over 100. Shenzhen, uh, near to Hong Kong, joined C40, came into the network and just said, what is this all about? We've got 1,000 fully electric buses already on the road. Our entire fleet of 8,000 will be totally electric within the next three years. Nanjing already has 4,000 uh, public transport vehicles that are fully electric. Beijing has just ordered 1,000. They're manufacturing them in, in China, uh, and it's in response to the, partly to the, the political pressures coming from poor air, air quality in China, but they're now building a really strong and, I'm sure, very successful in the future uh, industry that will sell to the rest of the world. And indeed, we've used that as a spur uh, within C40. 20 old of our mayors now got together, having seen the Shenzhen example, uh, and launched something, a clean bus declaration, which was a, essentially an attempt to move, to shift the markets in North, South, and uh, America, and Europe towards electric vehicles. So saying to their indigenous manufacturers, essentially, if you don't start supplying us with electric buses at a price that we can afford, then we're going to be buying the Chinese ones. Uh, I think they'll, they probably will be buying the Chinese ones because they're available soon, but it's starting to shift the market. Boris Johnson told us uh, in Paris, the mayor of London, that the price of electric hybrid buses has gone down by 10% in just a few months since that declaration uh, was launched, and he called all the European manufacturers into his office. And looking, looking at the sort of the scale of ambition, uh, and a city much smaller uh, than, uh, than this one, uh, but with great ambitions like, like you have. Uh, Oslo plans, and I'm sure will succeed in being fully zero carbon for transport by 2020. Now, they can do this because they've got 100% renewable electricity for their metro system, but th I can tell you that it's not, they're not just applying this to public transport vehicles. 30% of the cars that were sold in Oslo last year were electric. So very much stimulated by the mayor investing in the infrastructure, the recharging infrastructure, a tax system that favours ele electric vehicles and puts a premium on buying the old polluting uh, vehicles, but also direct city investment in uh, electric buses. Uh, and as we will, we're not going to, in any city, is there's not going to be able to be an entire shift to public transport, cycling and walking. We need cars, and lots of citizens have to have cars and rely on them. But some interesting experiments in how that can work. Uh, Paris, where, where I'm a lot these days, has been very successfully introduced a car uh, hire scheme, much like their successful bike hire scheme, the Autolib, uh, which for just 10 euros a day means that you can uh, hire an electric car in the centre of the city. These little cars, four seats, but a, a range of 250 kilometres, so you can go quite a long way for your um, 10 euros. But notably, as we talk to the major car manufacturers, uh, in Europe in particular, but around the world, they're very much changing their business model in response to what the mayors and the big cities are doing now. So BMW is saying that its strategy for the future will no longer to be uh, a company that manufactures and sells vehicles. They want to sell mobility. So they will sell people uh, in a kind of club system the option to maybe have uh, an open-top car at the weekend, but during most of the week to be using a ticket to use the public transport or to use a bike. Uh, and it's the whole package of mobility that they will sell, and they, they envisage selling a lot fewer uh, vehicles over the long run. But I've left, I've left this to the end of the kind of transport segment, but actually, for me, it's really the one that's the most Im important which is the return of the bike as an accepted form of mass, mass used rather than ma mass used transport in major cities. And when I was um, a transport advisor to the, to the mayor, it seems a long time ago, 16 years ago I started now, when I introduced uh, the idea that we should be investing heavily in cycling to the then 
uh, leadership of, of transport for London, I was literally laughed at. Even though I was the, uh, the representative of the mayor, they just laughed at me and said, you know, that, that we're, we're running transport for London. We're not going to mess around with bikes. It'd be hard to go to a major city now where you, where you would find that attitude um, persisting. Most cities are desperately trying to enable more people um, to cycle. Uh, and some great examples around the world. The two images on the screen here are both uh, from Rio de Janeiro uh, in Brazil. And actually, the, the first one was taken on the, the day that I went to meet uh, Mayor, Mayor Eduardo Paez when he'd taken over as the chair of the C40. He arrived rather late uh, for our meeting, which he's allowed to do. He's the mayor. But he was covered in dust, which was a bit odd. And uh, kind of brushing it off as he came in. And he came in and kind of casually said, oh, I'm sorry I'm late, Mark. I've just been dynamiting a highway. <laughs> and he, the image here is he had blown up that morning uh, the six-lane elevated highway that ran through the central business district and out to the, uh, across the, the poor area. <laughs> and uh, what is there uh, now is it's enabled them to put in a new light rail uh, that will take people from the new Olympic site. This is all leveraging the Olympic investment through the central business district and out to a totally rejuvenated um, port area where there's this most extraordinary new museum, the Museum of Tomorrow, where C40 will uh, have an, an office, has, has an office as of this week uh, indeed, and a cycle route that will connect up with now 450 kilometres of cycle lanes across Rio. Previously one of the most car-dominated cities uh, in the world and, and using very cleverly using the Olympic uh, legacy um, to do that. But we've seen cycling really taking off. Cycle share schemes uh, now uh, over 700 across the world. Only five of them existed uh, in 2000. And some really good evidence for why you need to invest in cycling. So in Copenhagen, where as I say, 45% of trips to work by bike. But there the city has, est has estimated that the average trip, for the average trip, which is about four kilometers in Copenhagen, saves a dollar each trip in health costs through improved health, reduced air pollution in the city. So a significant health premium uh, for the city. And where in C40 we'll be put putting most of our effort is in China. This is a country that in, until only a decade ago, 70% of trips in the big city were made by bike. It's now down on average to about 10 or 15%. But whereas when I was first going out to China 10 years ago, I was proudly being shown by the transport officials the graphs of how cycling had reduced and cars had gone up and how they intended to keep that going. Now they show the same graphs, but with the, we want to stop it here. Uh, and I think to, if you've got a 10 or 15% rate of cycling in your city, you really want to keep it. Uh, and I, I think they'll be successful. I, I, I hope, and then by the reaction, I guess most of what's been said so far is, is not controversial. I can sense in this city there's a, a lot of consensus about where you need to go. One of the things which generally is, is controversial, perhaps not here, is that it really seems impossible that the kind of vision of a, a city based on mass transit, cycling and walking can be achieved without some really difficult decisions like introducing road pricing. It's something I was very much involved in in introducing in London, and it was absolutely the keystone of everything that Mayor Livingstone was able to achieve. Both because in reducing 250,000 car trips into the city centre each day through what was then a very modest charge, five pounds um, a day, just in, just in working hours, it completely unlocked the space that enabled us to have a bus revolution, a shift, a 50 or 60% increase in bus passengers, 300% uh, now increase in cycling over a period um, of a decade. But also it was very important attitudinally because it sent out the message that the car is no longer king, that the roads are for everybody, and most people aren't driving. Most people, in London at least, are using public transport and cycling uh, and walking. And London became, through that decision, the first major city in the world to achieve a shift away from cars to public transport, which continues um, to this day. Stockholm, which followed London uh, in introducing congestion charging, has now registered a 35% fall in transport emissions. And note this, whilst their economy has grown 40%. Same case in London. So really successful economies on the back of brave decisions uh, by very brave mayors that have changed transport in those cities. And I should say, in the case of London, because I was a political advisor to the mayor, it, 
Every opinion poll that we took in the run-up to congestion charging said that the public was against it and that the mayor would not win re-election if, re if it was introduced. Two weeks after it was introduced, 60% of Londoners were in favour of it and the mayor won with a thumping majority at the next election. So it just took that bravery to know that it was the right thing to do and once people had seen it in action that they would support it. So the final of the, the sort of three segments of this, I started in talking about compact and dense cities as a, a sign of a successful city in the future, then the really connected cities through uh, mass transit. The final one uh, is this concept of really coordinated cities. And certainly I think it's the case that the successful cities of the future will very much run on data. Again here an example uh, from Rio de Janeiro. This is the operation centre in Rio, uh, put in place after some really dreadful mudslides in the cities that killed hundreds uh, of people um, overnight. Uh, and one of the reasons, the terrible conclusions they came to some months later was all of those deaths could have been prevented if there'd been better coordination between the emergency services. You see the, the quote from the mayor at the top. He says, I sleep better thanks to it, the rear operations centre. The worst thing is not having the information to not have the tools to act, but we do now. So what this operation centre does is it brings together all of the emergency services, but also the waste management services and some others, so that the data is shared across the city and they can see in real time how it's affecting the city. It's not a, it's not a, a breathtaking concept by Western city standards, but it's totally transformed that city in, in Brazil. And I think there's a lot that they've done there that could be, lear could be learned in other cities. But perhaps more at a scale that's relevant um, for Auckland, Benchmarking is really the, the starting point for dramatic uh, and, and revolutionary uh, change. And in, in New York, uh, through the policies of Mayor Bloomberg and now Mayor de Blasio and their one city built to last, they're really sort of focusing down on this, you, you can't manage what you can't measure, or the positive, you can only manage what you can measure. And so through the use of powerful local laws that the mayor has in that case, they've mandated that every building has to produce uh, its energy data that can be shared publicly uh, and are now well on the way to achieving a 30% reduction in their greenhouse gas emissions from, benchmark, uh, from, uh, from building energy use, largely through to that benchmarking. So simply the provision of good information driving better outcomes as building owners and building managers realise the cost savings that are there to be had if they can improve the efficiency of the buildings and the public sector driving the policy by going first and driving up standards within the public building realm. Uh, Tokyo's tried uh, a slightly different but equally successful uh, route. They introduced a cap and trade scheme for uh, commercial buildings within the city, about 1,400 of the biggest that were set uh, targets four or five years, hence by which they had to have uh, achieved a cap in the level of emissions for the building. Uh, and if they didn't uh, achieve the cap, they would have to pay a fine uh, and introduced a, a credit system that could be traded. Actually, they've exceeded the targets. They, they set a target of a 17% reduction in their emissions. They've exceeded that, got 25% without any trading. Uh, this may be a cultural uh, phenomena, but none of the building owners wanted to have the ignominy of being the ones that didn't achieve uh, the target. Uh, but that, that solution is now being copied by, uh, and I use the word a lot, copied. It's a really good thing in C40 copying. Uh, stealing, it's not a bad thing. Stealing good ideas. Uh, being copied by six Chinese cities, uh, most of which are now in, in C40, all in slightly different ways. There's, there's much more trading going on. But again, it seems to really be successful, and it, it's something I see being adopted uh, around uh, the world. Uh, a slightly different route here, but focusing on the public sector. And when we look across C40, uh, a third of building emissions are in publicly owned buildings, buildings owned by the city council or, or by the mayoral authority. London has, uh, has had the problem that many uh, mayors face, which is the knowledge of what needs to be done, but not the resources to achieve it. And in this case, lacking the ability to borrow or having the, the capital funds to invest in improving the municipal building stock. The mayor there has got round this by uh, a system of energy performance contracting. So essentially uh, asking private firms to come in, uh, put up the money to invest in 
the improving the efficiency of buildings and then allowing them to realize a profit out of a portion of the uh, saving in energy bills that the city then realizes. It's a win-win both for the city uh, and for now a vibrant energy performance contracting uh, uh, sector within London. 1,500 buildings have been dealt with so far in about five or six years. But look at the figures at the bottom here, which I think are equally Im important here, the economic and social gains. Every pound spent on reducing fuel poverty in London, this is around the housing stock, uh, cuts health bills by 40 pence. So 40% of that, of, of that pound. The tax returns of £1.27 for every pound invested in this building energy efficiency program due to job creation uh, and lower bills. And most of that money, that's because most of the money that's spent on things like energy, building energy retrofit, comes straight back in to the local uh, economy, particularly when you're, you're dealing with lower income households. But I'm in the this is in the loose area of better coordinated cities and the better use of data. One of the things, of course, that we see lots of our member cities is being really innovative in how they design their buildings. And this is an example here of the bioreactive uh, facade. It's actually uh, a project uh, that was started by uh, one of my former employers, uh, the engineering firm Arup uh, in, in Hamburg. Uh, but is now being adopted by uh, different firms in Paris. And the concept here is really simple. They're growing algae on the facades of the building. This provides, uh, one, an insulating uh, effect, but through simple photosynthesis, it also creates, in Hamburg's case, an energy source. That algae is uh, then turned into uh, gas, which is used to provide all of the uh, clean electricity uh, through a generator for that building. In Paris, the algae is being used as a fertilizer on the growing urban farming sector. Uh, and here, this is using the facilities that are available to the, to the city. So I haven't talked very much about actual renewable energy generation in cities because in most places, there isn't that much scope to have big wind turbines, etc. But there's plenty of opportunity for putting algae on the facade of buildings and indeed solar panels on the top. And I think really moving to that concept that Jeremy Rifkin has been pioneering as buildings as power plants, not just as places uh, to live uh, and to work. Uh, and I, to continue with that, the, the nature theme, and I, I, I admit I stuck this in at, at the last moment, having spent some, some wonderful time uh, down at the waterfront um, today. But again, looking at the natural resources available to the city, when the Hurricane Sandy hit New York a few years ago with devastating uh, effects, both in loss of, uh, of life, but also $50 billion cost to the economy, as the, the mayor's office has been looked how to prevent such uh, devastation in the future. One of the perhaps surprising solutions they, they've come, a, come upon is to start planting oyster beds uh, off the, the coast of New York. And the reason for this, New York, of course, used to be called the big oyster, the staple diet of the uh, American Indians and indeed the first European settlers in New York uh, was the humble oyster. It's only recently become kind of more of a delicacy, but it was completely, uh, first of all, farmed to near death and then killed by pesticide runoff uh, as agribusiness really grew up in the 20th century. Um, but oysters provide... Uh, an effect of somewhat deadening the impact of storms as they come in uh, to land. But with a, a kind of beautiful symmetry here, the chosen place for these new oyster beds will be at the feet of the wind turbines being put up in the Hudson to provide New York uh, with clean power. And I think it's a wonderful small example uh, of how a city and a mayor has been really inventive at using the natural resources at their disposal. So coming to, to conclusion now and kind of back to, to where, I, where I started, one of, I, I'm, a, I'm a definitely very much a, a, an optimist and one of my reasons for optimism is the change that I've really seen happen in, in the 10 or 15 years or so that I've been involved uh, in city government. But most importantly, the ability of the great cities of the world uh, to work uh, together. Uh, the ability to compete but at the same time to collaborate. And all of the cities in C40 are competing. They're competing for investment. They're competing to attract the best people. They're competing for simple kudos. But it doesn't stop them getting into room, a room together and sharing ideas and grabbing them from each other. And this is one of the, the statistics of which I'm most proud 
about C40, that when we surveyed our members a few months ago and looked at all of the actions that they had delivered on climate change over the last 10 years, they told us that a third, or near, near enough, 30% of all that action had been delivered through collaboration with other cities. Of course, the big issue, and I've, I've hopefully mentioned a lot as I've talked tonight about the economic benefits of climate action and the social benefits, but of course it's, the, it's usually the barrier that's put up to robust climate action, that we've got to put development first, or we've got to put the economy first, we've got to put jobs first. But it is possible to decouple carbon emissions from economic growth, and we can see it in a number of cities across C40. This graph uh, from the London School of Economics is showing the figures for Portland, uh, Oregon, which I've mentioned a few times today, but they're a real, really exciting small uh, city on climate change. And you can just see that the lines go in the right direction. That one at the blue at the top is their, their GVA, their GDP per capita, growing really nice and steeply over a 20-year period. Uh, employment growing steadily throughout the same time. But the bottom red line, their greenhouse gas emissions per capita going down steeply towards uh, the kind of trajectory that is needed to fulfill the Paris Agreement. And so I'll, I'll leave you with the, the, the last thought, which is uh, one I can't claim to, to, to have created, but of the, the American political philosopher Ben Barber. What if mayors ruled the world uh, rather than presidents and prime ministers? There's one, there's one chuckle from the front, obviously. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a, a serious idea here. The, the, particularly in the West, the, the nation state as it currently exists really is a throwback to the birth of capitalism uh, in the early uh, to late 18th century. And the nation state was set up to defend a geographic border to put in place trade tariffs, have an barriers, because they don't control the, the, the instruments of trade barriers. Instead, Cities and mayors compete with each other by investing in their city so that it's a more attractive place to live, so that it's got better public transport, so that it's got lower air pollution. So it creates that competition, creates a drive to the kind of outcomes uh, that we want to see. And so I think we're already seeing in the field of climate change that the real leadership, political leadership in the world is being shown by mayors and city leaders. And I think that's just the start of, of what's to come and the reason I am uh, optimistic that we will tackle climate change is because of the leadership shown by mayors around the world in C40 and indeed it very much in, in, in evidence in this city. Uh, and I very much look forward to discussing that with you uh, for the next half hour or so. Thank you very much. Um, you, can, you can stay up here with us. Yep, fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, this just in, um, this conversation is not that it's all about what's going on in social media, but we're actually better than The Bachelor at this point. Um, <laughs> sorry to take you away from that at home. Um, sorry about that. Um, we're actually the number one trending conversation on Twitter in New Zealand right now. So thank you to all our supporters and everyone talking about this. So um, these events aren't just mistakenly called Auckland Conversations. They're really about generating buzz and exchange and the positive exchange of ideas around a group um, like you all, who could be trusted to bottle up the really good ideas and hold that enthusiasm and release it into the general populace. Um, so please take that responsibility quite seriously. Um, so, so now let's not waste too much time me bantering. Let's get um, our guests up here. We've got a bit of time for a real conversation. And I'd like to welcome two of um, the other panelists up here. One uh, is Alex Cutler from the New Zealand Green Building Council. She's the executive director there. Um, Alex has focused her career on uh, the building and construction sector in NZGBC um, and influencing businesses to appreciate and adopt the strategic opportunities that sustainability represents. Um, before, Alex undertook sustainability strategy consulting at a number of big brands like Nike, Ford, and Shell, whilst, whilst at Sustainability Limited and at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Let's welcome Alex to the stage, shall we? <laughs> 
I was trying to figure out how long can I go before she just sort of runs me over to get to the stage. The other, the other panelist I'd like to welcome up here is Patrick Reynolds. Um, he's an Auckland photographer, writer, and specializing in architecture, transport, and urban design. And he's a member and really one of the chief contributors to Auckland Transport Blog. You know about Auckland Transport Blog, I would imagine. Um, he also tutors at the School of Architecture at University of Auckland. Um, he, he may well be a familiar face to the regular attendees of Auckland Conversations. Um, usually a pretty enthusiastic audience member. Um, and I think it goes to show if you actually participate well in the conversations, you might get a promotion. Yep. So welcome to the stage, Patrick. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Very yeah. kind. So at this point, we'd like to just generate some discussion, and we'll reach into the audience when we're talking about a particular topic and, and get that exchange going. But I guess I reserve the right to kick the questions off. So I'm going to start with the elephant in the room, um, a real live one here. Um, Mark touched upon it um, at some length in his presentation. Um, you know, we've signed an agreement for energy efficiency uh, as council. I know Panuku's done the same. Watercare is doing the same. AT is about to do the same. That's awesome. We're doing great work. Um, we're doing some fun and exciting stuff in the waste sector, and it's not to belittle those two very important contributors to climate change. But um, sustainability seems to, in, to really mean transport, urban growth, land use. And I know much of this is in the hands right now of the independent hearings panel and lawyers, but what, dear panel, is really the conversation we need to have about um, our urban form and density in Auckland? And I wonder if Patrick can start us out in that conversation, because I know he's going to go for it. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, um, New Zealand is, as Mark mentioned, we're fortunate, really, to have at least around 80% of our electricity generation is already renewable, and we can push on to the eight and 90 to 100 with not too much effort, in fact. So when it comes to carbon emissions, setting aside the agricultural source at the moment, uh, because we're in cities, the real big issue is transport. And the flip side of the transport coin, of course, is, is urban form. The two are, are, are deeply interrelated. Uh, I think the biggest problem we have uh, in Auckland is a tendency in the current conversation to wave away this problem by saying that electric vehicles are coming, so uh, we'll just wait. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of problems with that argument, one of which is that we have a, a very old average age of our, of our car fleet, which is uh, generally the average age is around 14 years. We have a, a slow turnover, therefore, of vehicles. Also, we, we buy a lot of second-hand vehicles. Um, we're kind of trickle-down, we're at the end of the, uh, of the technology train. It's going to take a very long time. Now, Bloomberg uh, says that by 2040, this is a long way in the future, a third of, of private vehicles will be being manufactured will be electric vehicles. Uh, so taking all of those compounding factors, it seems unlikely that we will have a very uh, a high proportion of electric vehicles in our, our fleet anytime soon. In other words, we cannot, simply cannot just rely on that. We have to also change how we move substantially, and that also means how we live, where we live, and we have to double down on proximity and in order to stop, <laughs> to cut this short. So we, the, the argument around the unitary plan simply isn't one uh, or about how we build from now on. It, it has to involve uh, sustainability, it has to involve proximity and, and our mobility options. And, that, and because we're, we're building Auckland very fast at the moment, we're doubling down, we're committing to a certain urban form right now. And if we keep committing to a poor, sprawling one, um, we, we're going to be left behind in this competition for cities, as, as Mark says. If, we, if we're late to get on this bus, we won't find a seat. Thanks, Patrick. Hey, Alex, um, what, um, what are your thoughts in this space? And um, why don't you wrap in a little conversation about housing quality? <laughs> um, so I am generally an optimistic person. And I was listening to the mayor talk about when you started in 2010. And I started as the Green Building Council chief executive in 2010. And um, I think, I feel like we've been on a bit of an emotional roller coaster about sustainability in New Zealand. and. I have to admit to times when I have felt really down about the situation. And I'm ashamed to admit that when I met Mark earlier on, I was being a little bit down at that time. And you were so optimistic about Auckland and what's going on in Auckland. And then it was hearing the mayor doing the recap of actually how much we have achieved and how different it is and how positive it is. And I thought, actually, we have. We have done a bit. You know, we have done a bit. Uh, we haven't done as much as some of the other cities. Um, but I do think that there is huge optimism um, and a will to change that 
from some people, but I also think that we are just horribly caught up in this just vicious politics about densification, when actually we do need to step back and think of the collective picture and think of the kind of city that we want to achieve. Um, and I, um, there are so many thoughts going through my head when I was listening to everybody talking earlier on, uh, lots and lots of points to get across, but, but quality is obviously, you know, Green Building Council, I mean, we, we started off thinking about buildings and we've expanded that and we think about communities and how do you create those kinds, of, how do you create a sustainable built environment? And I love it because in our vision we talk about, uh, I should know it off by heart. <laughs> um, we talk about a, a sustainable built environment and New Zealanders living, working, and playing. And then I think, what do we actually mean by a sustainable built environment? You know, and uh, and I think I inherently know what it means, and I think a lot of you do. But I, I need to get better at conveying what that actually means. That that means planned communities. That that does mean that that lovely statistic was it 80% of people. God, whose was it? There was a city that had 80% of people able to walk and... It's the target for Portland. Mm. It was yeah. fantastic. I love that. What a great, what a great statistic. Proximity. Yeah, that's right. And, and so how do, we, you know, how do we create cities that are more like that? Um, there isn't a segue, but the quality side. Oh, I think we have such a long way to go on quality. Um, and I am kind of distressed at how um, at central government level there is a lack of ambition on this subject in this country. And uh, I appreciate that we are talking about cities today and I, and I think, you know, I think there, is a, there are great opportunities around cities, but it would be really nice to have central government backing that situation. And so I suggest that we need a Minister for Urban Affairs because I think if cities are so important to us, then we really need to be much more serious at central government level as well about that subject. Um, I think the quality of our built form is behind other cities, um, and I would really, really like to change that. And I would like more people kind of getting behind and backing. And, and you know, it might be a little bit difficult and a little bit painful to get to that point, but we, we seriously need to have a vision um, of the quality of, of the kind of quality built environment that we would really like in New Zealand, and so I think another thing we need is a is a housing strategy. Actually, thank you, Alex. Mark, you've been around. Um, judging by flying in at one in the morning and then being ready for a meeting at like seven thirty, you, you get around to a number of cities, and you've seen many of us wrestle with this issue of uh, the, intens the intensification, the great intensification debate. I heard somebody talk about it the other day. Um, when I was in Seattle, we had that same conversation. I'm sure all C40 cities to some degree have had this conversation. How, how do you crack through this? I know the context's different, the central government relationships are always different, but how have you seen cities advance that conversation, get over that um, afraid of density done not well? Well, I, th I think the, the main thing which you clearly, clearly have is you've got to have a vision for where the city's going and some really strong leadership behind it because the cities that have successfully densified in a way that the public now really like and it, it's what makes the city successful like the Copenhagen's they've had a strong policy and they've delivered it very consistently over a long period of, of time uh, so I think that that's quite you know it's the I, I take the it's the words of uh, Ian Brown, the singer of one of my favourite bands, The Stone Roses. He says, it's, it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. So don't worry so much about where you start from. But the thing is, having a very clear vision about where you want to go to and then bringing all, bringing all the things together. Because when, once you achieve that kind of higher level of density and it allows to have the strong, uh, frequent public transport system, people will see what they were missing. Mm. Fantastic. So, so let's, throw, let's throw a question from the audience about the urban forum and, and densification. I'm going to go right to the tallest hand. Yes, sir. Wait for the mic so I don't have to repeat the question. Thanks. Hi. Um, the, the stuff that C40 is doing sounds quite amazing. Uh, just a curiosity question. What happens if you have a C40 member and who, get, who elects a mayor who has a direct opposite view and starts pulling everything to pieces? And have you had that happen <laughs> and what you've done about it when they're... <laughs> Well, <laughs> the ejection conversation. <laughs> yeah, you've only just joined. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> um, well, so asking for a friend. <laughs> Are they mayoral candidates in the audience? Let's check. <laughs> so we do. We have uh, very serious participation standards, uh, and 
every, uh, we have a steering committee of uh, 12, of uh, elected 12 mayors, which meets every quarter, and every quarter I have to take them through the performance statistics for all of the members. And if there are any that have fallen into the quartile that means they're not meeting the participation standards, then our steering committee has a discussion about whether the chair should issue them with a letter telling them that their membership will be revoked. It has happened a few times, and in each case, the city has very quickly uh, turned, turned it round. And, and I would say it's interesting, because there have been some real, real shifts in mayoral leadership in some cities, including, I'm not sure, I, I probably shouldn't name cities, but there are some obvious candidates where mayors have taken over, they're essentially climate deniers. Actually, we haven't seen a huge shift away from the delivery of the climate policies because there's been retained in place some very committed officers who are very well connected within C40 that have managed to keep things going. What you've, what's got lost is the sort of pace of, of change and in case, in, instead things have stuttered along. I'm sure it won't happen here. That's right. He's looking at every single one of you when he says that. <laughs> Another question back here on the left. Graham. Uh, wait for the mic, please. It's chasing you. Sorry, I was going to ask a very similar question, but I'll phrase it in a different way. Surely the important thing is, yes, you need the mayors, you need the inspiration, but mayors come in different stripes, and um, a future mayor might not be as strong or even opposed, as, as was alluded to. So surely it's important having got the mayor involved, to then get some sort of a, a, a document, a declaration, whatever, on the part of the whole of the city government. The mayor is only one person. Here in Auckland, there are 20 governing body members, and when decisions are made, the mayor only has one vote. So um, if you've got the city on side, then you've got more chance of the thing being long-term, and it, beyond the life or political life of the current mayor. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think it's about the political continuity. And I think that's one, I'll just feel this quite quickly. Um, that's one reason why we have an Auckland plan. We have a vision for our city over 30 years. And embedded in that plan, there's a chapter on climate change, eh, but it's actually a, every chapter. And there's also a target for us to reduce our emissions 40% by 2040. That is my, my guess, is not going away. Um, so in terms of continuity, we're committed to that as a city and as a region. Um, you know, the, the politics and the, all the you know, continuity will change, but that mission and that vision is, is the same. Um, I'm gonna shift the conversation just slightly um, because I have this opportunity to ask questions um, about something that we've talked about quite a bit in Auckland over the last decade and probably even before, certainly before I got here. Um, and that's um, both either how we fund or manage demand on our transport network. And one of the conversations I think we've been had with the mayor leading this um, from Auckland is around um, road pricing and around congestion charging. And I ask this partially because we know Mark's history and working for the mayor um, of London on this for Red Kent. So um, some insights into, uh, first from Mark, and then I'm sure you've, you might have some, some thoughts, Patrick. Um, what, um, what's worked, what can you, you've been in Auckland for all of 48 hours, um, you, you, you know some of the context, you're a quick study, um, but you know, some, some thoughts to Auckland and some advice on how we can get that conversation to the right place and get some good outcomes. Well, I hesitate to say anything about Auckland in a room full of people who know a lot more than me, but I'd say sort of generically, I, I, I struggle to see, and I, I, I do travel to a, a large number of cities, I, I really struggle to see how most cities in the world are going to tackle transport without pricing. Just in the, it, it, You've got to create space on the roads in order to get the public transport system really working, and you've got to create both an incentive to use public transport, which is normally more of it, more reliable, cheaper, but you've got to have a disincentive to get out of the car because it's so seductive uh, to use once you've made that huge investment in this great lump of, of metal. The, the, the real lessons I, I'd learned, though, in the place, because it's, it's, it's tried and failed in, in, in some cities, is it's really hard to win the public argument until people have seen how the, how the charge works. So in, in London, the mayor introduced the charge a year before an election, so he was able to say to the city, if it doesn't work, just vote me out in a year's time. In Stockholm, I think they very cleverly haven't seen how that worked. They said, we're going to introduce the charge, going to run it for six months, and then we'll have a referendum. 
the public opinion before the charge was introduced was massively against, after they'd seen it working, massively in favour, and it was voted in very easily. In the cities that have failed to, to bring it in, and they, had, they mostly had good plans, uh, in Manchester and England, for example, they had the referendum before they brought the charge in, and it was completely lost, mostly through a very successful campaign of misinformation by the driving lobby that managed to persuade a large swathes of the Manchester population that they were going to be, have to pay this charge when they never drove their car in the charging area at the times at which the charge was levied. So I think one thing is that's thinking about the point at which you, you get uh, a, a public vote. The, the second, though, is really paying attention to the information that's given out. So uh, in, in the experience in London, we, we, had to, we spent controversially a lot of public money on public information, but it was absolutely vital that people understood just how small the charging area was and, and, and when it operated, because we had designed it very carefully, so it mostly only affected relatively wealthy Londoners, who could afford already to drive their car into the centre of the city and the high, very high parking charges that existed there. And it was, it was critical to get that understanding amongst the population. Patrick, do you have any thought? I mean, maybe you've thought... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, ha, maybe you've not thought about this before? Or just what are yeah. your quick insights? And I, we, we have just a few more minutes, unfortunately. But okay, we'll give us the, the basics here. Well, I think there's a, there's a number of observations. I'm it, absolutely very hard to disagree with it being the most, um, really one of the most important levers we can pull. Uh, uh, essentially, driving is an underpriced good, so therefore it is overbought. I mean, that's the simple theory of it. Uh, th the interesting problem for Auckland is if we look at the, the poster children for road pricing, that's London, Stockholm, and Singapore. These are three cities with extremely mature alternative networks incredibly mature public transport networks, especially completely off-road versions, the underground, etc. So that is not the case in Auckland. Um, the mayor, in fact, has been proposing it as a means to fund the delivery of, of such a network. So that this is problematic. Um, if we just fund a cordon, um, what there would be uh, unintended consequences, perhaps, in terms of the performance of the city. Uh, we don't have a, such a strong centre as, say, London does. Uh, if we just charge the motorway network, well, then we're kind of pushing um, people onto the local roads, which is why we built the motorway network in the first place, so that's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, the other potential option is an, uh, that technology offers us is a, is a GPS-based system, which means, um, although there'd be privacy concerns, every car has a GPS system, exactly the same as your cell phone, uh, and, and it's a time of day and place variable charge on across the entire network. But if you're driving a rural road in Rodney, even at rush hour, you're not going to be charged, but if you're driving in the middle of the town at 4 a.m., you're also not going to be charged, and this is a, a, a possible system, I think, that could be tailor-made for Auckland. Um, I think the other political way of dealing with this is to make it revenue neutral in the sense that you... Um, withdraw other taxes. Currently, for example, 50% of your rates go onto the transport buzz budget. So I, can, I could imagine a successful campaign by a mayor where they're saying, we're going to drop your rates by X, by 25%, um, but there will be this uh, time variable, place variable road charging. So you'll only pay that. So this, there's an equity argument here. If you're the little old lady that doesn't have a car, never uses the road system directly. Um, but you're paying very high rates. This is, this is an, uh, you know, from an equity point of view, possible. But then that won't help us fund a, a radical improvement to the public transport network. So um, this could also be uh, revenue neutral on the petrol tax, but that also may have unintended consequences of, of making uh, driving cheaper in another area. So we might want to add a carbon tax. So <laughs> there's lots of ways through it. But I think, I think the, sing the Stockholm model of actually um, putting it in place and then asking coming back is, is absolutely the way to deliver it, yeah. One of the massive challenges is actually to um, recognize that we're starting to run out of time. And so I'm gonna break the rules just so slightly, I just got the look, but I'm gonna break the rules ever so slightly um, because people generally seem riveted. Um, and I'm also gonna make a bit of a rule here. And I'm just gonna do kind of a quick lightning round. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just say top of mind. And I, the great thing about this is I didn't prepare them for this, so they're probably, you know, they're, this is, no, there's, no. there's no, they don't know what I'm about to say. I probably don't even know what I'm about to say. Um, but, but, but real quick, a couple words. Best global innovation that we need to land here in Auckland. Just top of mind, people. What, 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 what's out there? We just saw Mark give us the whole solution oh. set. E-bikes. E E-bikes. I, I quite liked, frankly, I quite like the algae thing. I didn't know anything about that. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'll go for that one. <laughs> 
Mark, it's not fair. It's like picking your favorite child, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think the huge opportunity here is, mm. is just the plain old bike. You could, the, your roads are made for cycling. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Okay, um, I'm riding home, but I forgot my lights, so um, be careful. Um, worst thing we should stop doing because it's just plain stupid. Sprawling. Oh, building poor quality, building in obsolescence in poor quality homes and, and buildings. You can choose to answer or just pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sprawl, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and motorways. Um, Harbour crossing. Best. <laughs> that's three. Okay, good, good segue. Best thing we can work <laughs> with central government on? I'll leave Mark out of this because that's just not fair. Well, the transport alignment process could be absolutely genius. Depends. Let's leave it there. Which Alex? way we align. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I've already said I think some kind of minister for urban affairs would be a really good thing. Mm. Um, but uh, I have also been thinking more recently about I think that there really needs to be a housing strategy for this country where a whole load of collaborators are actually discussing across the board the kind of homes that we, that we think that New Zealanders want to live in, um, because I think we're really unambitious in that space. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Favorite transport project? City railing. Favorite building? Oh. Oh, God, that is hard. Oh. <laughs> Think of all those people who are going to get pissed off with me. Um, One of your many favorite buildings? Um, I actually <laughs> did do, an, I, so Home Magazine did an article on me when, and they asked me what my favorite building was. So I'm going to just do that one because I said that about five years ago. Uh, I think the Christchurch Civic Building is a fantastic example of a sustainable building. It's a, you know, kind of a behemoth of an old concrete building. Mm. It's repurposed, great architecture, you know, great sustainable facilities and six green star. I mean, what more can I say? Sorry. All right. All that right. wasn't quick. But. And um, it's not fair for Mark, but maybe one of our favorite Auckland Conversations speakers, audience, perhaps Mark Watts. <laughs> so <laughs> give him a hand. So let, I w we just started a ton of conversations, and um, it, the, the impossibility here is, is now I need to start kind of aiming toward closing it down. So let's give thanks to our panel here. Give him another hand. And I'm going to hand it over to our very capable and brilliant Deputy Mayor. And, and another clap, f I'm sorry, another clap for Penny Hulse, our Deputy Mayor. Yeah. Absolutely. Gosh, the hard things. Shutting down this conversation just feels almost impossible. But I just want to say a few very, very quick things. On the question of what happens if you elect a mayor who doesn't support C40, there's a very simple answer, don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So... Also, for me, one of the most telling parts of the discussion today, the conversation tonight, was that quote by the Bogota mayor that an advanced city is not one where the poor drive cars, but where the rich ride buses. Let's think about that. And what we're in danger of in Auckland is the splitting in Auckland of two Aucklands, people who have access to public transport because they live in the intensified suburbs in the right places and can use public transport, and the poor who are condemned to use cars because they're in sprawl on the edges of our city. That is not a livable city. That's not a C40 city, and we just can't do that. So I think there... This has been one of the most compelling conversations ever, and the key take out of this is joining C40 is our step change. This is simply all of us who, I think Alex put it beautifully, this is an emotional roller coaster. Some of us who come from, you know, God, I'm nearly 57, come from the, you know, the, the celebration of the 90s, the heady days of the Rio Summit and Agenda 21, you know, that dastardly international conspiracy theory to make people do good things, God help us. But, you know, all of that amazing stuff that seemed so possible in the 90s suddenly got really hard and heavy when we were amalgamated this city. This feels to me like the lightness of that step change again. We've got something to aim for. We're back with that family of cities who can inspire us and whose ideas we can, you know, steal without apology. This is how we work. We borrow the experts, we borrow the good ideas and we adapt them for our own. And we go to that really um, wise bunch with some of the problems that we've got. And also, because we're damn good in New Zealand, we actually share some of the solutions we've got here already. So thank you for inspiring us. 
Patrick Reynolds, I'm completely in love with this man. I was in love with Te Reira. I announced at the Sustainability Awards that Reira, Te Reira was the love of my life. Patrick Reynolds, I'm afraid you've surpassed him. You are just simply wonderful. And it's because of this man that I am now biking every day. And for the last month, the last five months, I've biked pretty much every day to work. E-bikes are the answer. Alex, thank you so much for your inspiration for making us simply build better places and understand how we do them. Mark, you're extraordinary. Um, for, for the two of you to have arrived at some ungodly hour in the morning, to have been dragged off with us bunch out to the west to drink coffee and look at the Waitakere Ranges and for us to booble in your ears um, the way we did and to keep going the way you've done, Melag and, and Mark, thank you. You're extraordinary. Maylene, thank you. And finally, to John, our MC who's held this together and to everyone who's made this happen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.